All right, guys, so I'm covering chronic diseases, which is, I think, a very big topic to get through in 45 minutes, but I will try my best. Uh, one thing I have to say when we start this is that obviously I won't be able to go through everything, but from what I have tried to go through, I've tried to give you about as much information as I think you should know at, at, at on average. And I think I'm also going to be throwing a lot of guidelines at you today, which is basically the core of chronic diseases. Um, for people who haven't really done GP, or even people who have done GP, uh, I think it can be a little bit overwhelming, but I think if you get anything out of the session, just note down the topics and the important points, and then throughout the year you can consolidate and actually learn the information. So those are my details if anyone wants to ask me questions later. So can anyone tell me any specific chronic diseases that fall under those boxes? Yes, yeah, COPD. So who said that? I'm going to try my best to throw this. All right. But in the future, hands up because... All right. I'll try my best. Oh, God, that went completely... <laughs> Yeah, that might be great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. CPD is a good one. So I think uh, the main way I've tried to frac structure today is to go through respiratory COPD and asthma and then look at the more GP, RACGP guideline books for more cardiovascular issues, prevention, and screening for cancers. There's a few other conditions you should be aware of, such as osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, um, psychiatric conditions, which is obviously going to be covered in psychiatry, but there's a big overlap with GP. However, just in the interest of time, we won't be going through them today. So I'm focusing more on an OSCE angle rather than EMQ because I personally have felt that you need to know much more content in an OSCE than you need to know for an EMQ. Even the specific details, they, they do come up in OSCE. So I think if you're ready for an OSCE, you'll be ready for an EMQ. Um, so how do I get rid of this? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So there will be an OSCE session today, so I won't focus on the framework too much, but for those of you who have done GP, you might have heard of the 10-step management plan for, from Murtaugh. Anyone? So essentially every OSCE station and GP should follow this framework of 10 steps, um, generally when appropriate. But the main reason I brought it up on the screen is, first of all, to familiarize you, but point out sort of where my main focus of today will be on. So I think that, you know, with any condition, you guys can look it up, you can tell me the diagnosis and explain it to me. But really, the, the really nitty gritty bit is, first of all, how well you speak to a patient, how well you can convey what you want to say, but do you know your management? And is your management just for the condition that they've come in with, or is your management a holistic, looking at every single patient factor, and, and covering all bases, because ultimately that's what they want in GP. It's not quite like third year where you go in and you just manage an issue. You come in, you manage an issue, but then you move on and manage the patient as a whole. So it's much more involved. So for that reason, you can see number five says, make a management plan. It's not just treat the problem, treat their infection of COPD, but then treat them afterwards. You know, once their infection has gone away, what are you gonna do? You have to make a plan, you have to make follow up to go through that process. But similarly, when a patient comes in, they don't just have COPD. They likely have other comorbidities. They have probably lifestyle factors that need addressing, or they might be in an age group that, in, that requires them to get preventional strategies. So, you know, for example, mammography comes in after you reach kind of menopausal age, right? So those sort of things also have to be considered in an OSCE station for you to do well. Um, the rest, I think, you know, you'll go through when you have that OSCE station session at the end of the day. So I think I'll start off with COPD. Um, just very, very briefly, because I'm sure you guys have done it in third year, just a refresher, it's an obstructive lung disease. The main thing that you need to know for diagnosis is that on LFTs, you've got this 0.7 or under kind of mark. Um, and then there's a few definitions, you know, chronic bronchitis versus emphysema. And, um, yep. And you can see that primarily for, I think, GP, you'll be looking at people who have century asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, because that's mainly got to do with your smokers and people who have, who have damaged their lungs over their lifetime, and that's the bulk of the general population that comes in with COPD. So with that said, can anyone tell me sort of what signs they would see on a chest X-ray in a patient with COPD? Just any sign, does it have to be everything? Yep. Yeah, hyperinflation is a good one. So I'll just show you these two images. So this is um, 
more of an emphysema kind of picture. So you have this, you can see hyperinflation. Instead of having your normal six to eight anterior ribs, you have many more. I counted, I think it was something like nine or ten at the time. You can also see that the diaphragms are very flat, and in emphysema specifically, they also have very small hearts. Um, I won't be spending, you know, this whole lecture looking at radiology, but I think this is a, is a nice picture that can come up. The other thing that you can see with particularly emphysema is something called bulli. So that's when the lung area collapses and you get gas trapping. And you can see here, I don't know if it's easy to see on the screen, but there's a bubble. Can you see that? So that's a pretty big, what they call bulli. And you can see that as well with emphysmatous pictures. So moving on. COPD this year should be done through a specific framework called COPDX, and it's a nationally recognized framework that you can find many resources from. So at the end of all these slides, I have um, a list of references that you can refer to that are actually guidelines rather than hyperlinks. And when you Google them, they're from RICGP, Lung Foundation, Heart Foundation, and they should make up the core of sort of the answers that you provide in exams, because that is essentially the national guidelines that everyone uses. But COPDX is one of them, and you can see here uh, the sort of different steps that you go through. So to go through it properly, C is case finding and confirmation. So essentially you want to say, you know, okay, they have COPD, uh, not just because, you know, the LFT show this obstructive picture, but because they have the symptoms, breathlessness, you know, fatigue, uh, loss of weight. They have been smokers or they've been exposed to toxins throughout their life. And then apart from that, you also have to decide on the severity. So you can't treat COPD, but you can treat mild, moderate, and severe COPD. So you have to tailor it to the specific patient. So um, another question, based on that flow loop over there, can someone tell me whether E or F is more likely to be a picture of COPD? Hands up, any takers? Oh, yep. F, yep, so F is correct, primarily because you can see you've got this uh, scalloping over here and um, there's a reduction in flow rate as well. And then you can see in the other picture there's a few signs of mild, moderate, and severe based on symptomology and also uh, predicted sort of lung function as well, which you can read and learn in your own time. So the main bulk of all of this obviously comes down to the management, and that's under optimized function. There's a lot of things that go under that beyond pharmacology. So you have your bronchodilators, you have your corticosteroids, we'll discuss them later. But really, we have to have a look at the non-pharmacology. So if you see under activity, I wrote, you know, 150 minutes, five days of 30 minutes, vigorous exercise a week, two out of three should be muscle strengthening. That's a very good generic line for pretty much most chronic conditions. Um, I think it's applicable more or less to every single other guideline for other conditions. It's quite a generic thing that I like to use when I'm talking to a patient about sort of what exercise they should be doing. But it is applicable here as well. More specifically, we have pulmonary rehabilitation, chest physiotherapy, smoking cessation, um, nutrition, and then kind of the other ones that you could probably name drop, but you don't really have to explain that much in the interest of probably an eight minute OSCE session time limit, which is neuromuscular electrical stimulation, breathing exercises, and of course you must educate the patient. Um, and that also includes, you know, under patient education, inhaler technique. So inhaler technique is not just important in asthma, it's important in COPD. You can't really assess whether a management is effective if they're not really using their inhalers correctly. Um, another thing is to treat comorbidity. So this is what I was saying in general, that when a patient comes in with COPD, generally that population also has a lot of cardiovascular risk factors. They might be aging, so they might have osteoarthritis or osteoporosis. So you have to consider all of that because if the patient can't get up in the morning, because of other reasons, and they don't want to look after themselves or they're too tired, that's going to impact the actual management you're recommending to the patient for their COPD because they can't complete it. Um, but then more specifically, pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure, which is a direct result of, of pulmonary issues. And then surgery and palliation are other things, but I think they're very end stage and there's not a lot of evidence that it actually like, helps symptoms. It's more to prevent the person from surgery, for example, prevent the person from dying, so lung transplants and Sometimes you have bullectomies where they go in for those really big lumps that we saw in the x-ray and remove them because they tend to take up a lot of the chest space cavity and the patient obviously can't breathe and can't ventilate. So bronchodilators and corticosteroids, that's what everyone loves. That's their EMQ questions. That's what everyone always asks. This is basically the answer. People will tell you different things, but this is the answer and this is how you should be answering them. Uh, you can read them in your own time. Less relevant uh, for the 45 minute time limit. 
But one thing I did want to highlight is you can see I've highlighted here, LABA monotherapy should not be used when asthma and COPD coexist. And the reason for that is that if you have asthma underneath COPD and you don't obviously, you know, treat them with, with steroids and reduce that inflammation, you can have sort of mask symptoms that can lead to quite poor outcome and bad results. So that's just one thing that um, everyone sort of emphasizes and I, I don't know why it's kind of in that tiny little bottom bit because it is really reasonably emphasized. But other than that, you can see that it's based mild, moderate, severe would be FEV1s and then also the sort of management you should be looking at. Okay. Preventing deterioration is both for exacerbations of COPD, but then also for, no, actually, yeah, but then also for, you know, deteriorating COPD in general. So the FEV1 slowly dropping throughout the patient's life. We want to keep it as high as we can and as stable as we can. So the main thing is smoking. Smoking is the big thing for COPD. And at any given opportunity, you should try and instigate, we'll talk about it later, some smoking cessation strategies. More specifically, influenza and pneumococcal um, vaccinations, you could offer that to a patient. So influenza um, vaccines is given to anyone with a chronic disease regardless of their age. And pneumococcal, I think similarly, depending on the year, depending where you look, if you've got something like COPD, you would be eligible for them. I think from my reading, Haemophilus influenza vaccinations are available but haven't really proved to be super efficacious from the last time I read something, but I'm not 100% clear on that. And the other thing that comes up is antibiotics. So the question is, why don't we just, you know, give people antibiotics so they don't develop chest infections? And that's usually given with macrolides. I think azithromycin is one of them. Um, there's a little bit of argument for and against it because there are a lot of side effects that obviously come with being on antibiotics for long periods of time. So I think it's kind of for your people with multiple exacerbations, the really vulnerable population, really end stage problems, keep coming into hospital sort of picture. And uh, you have all your drugs and regular review. So, pediatrics, if you guys have done it, they really like their vaccinations and everyone focuses on them, but I think it's also important to remember your vaccinations for adults, particularly as I said, you know, with these GP stations, when you do the 10-step thing, one of them is prevention, and you should know for your age, for your population, for that condition, what should you be offering the patient. So that's a good list. And then this is a list for people at risk. It's a little bit different. Um, so for all of these pictures, I should have linked them in the comments section of the PowerPoint slide. And then at the end, like I said, there'll just be a list of guidelines you can refer to. So developing a plan of care. Um, this is sort of your holistic, you know, multidisciplinary team approach. Um, so you can involve, oh, sorry. You can involve a respiratory physician. Uh, for pulmonary rehabilitation, for example, you need to avoid a physiotherapist. If they've got other comorbidities, you might need a dietitian. You might need to involve a psychologist, a social worker, a lot of other things. But then more specifically, like you have an asthma action plan, you have a My COPD Action Plan, which um, I thought I had a picture with, but apparently I don't. <laughs> and as well, a few other things. Can anyone from the bottom, like Curb 60, whatever, any of them, pick one and tell me what they stand for? Yep. Yep. Good. So um, if you use any of these, if you use any of these uh, forms of assessing a patient, primarily this is used, you know, as a GP, if the patient comes in, you assess that and you see like, does this patient need to go to hospital? Do they need to be admitted? That's sort of the point of these, oh, I don't really know what they're called, assessment tools. Yep. <laughs> so pick any of them, they're all valid and just learn one and try and assess it and integrate it into your history taking. Managing exacerbations is the final one. Basically, it's, it's a lot of patient self-care. So you need to teach the patient to recognize when they're going downhill. You know, is their sputum changing color? Are they coughing more? Have they lost weight? Are they more tired? And then also keeping an accurate patient health record. So the patient themselves should have a folder of all their information and investigations so that when they do go to a different hospital or they have to go to a different GP clinic, it's not starting from zero. You know the baseline of their function. So we know that their FEV1 is usually 60. They've come in. It's you know, their oxygenation has dropped, this is different, this is something new, this is something that needs to be addressed. 
But then also after the exacerbation, clearly something's caused that. Was it because they weren't adherent to their medication? Was it because you know they didn't take care of themselves and they got sick? This is something the GP has to pick up on and try and adapt the management that they've got to better serve the patient. And then further referrals. Um, just another list of sort of allied health and, and specialist and also GP follow-up. So, oh, this wasn't meant to go on top of itself. I thought I did it better. Anyway, that's okay. Just put this on the side. So really briefly for asthma, because it's been done so many times in third year, uh, confirm the di diagnosis, always assess control, really big points in assessing control, particularly if they tell you, you know, I've been to hospital. Have you been to hospital in the last year? You know, had you have to stay overnight? Did you get admitted to ICU? Ask the specific questions. It's really important. Manage, educate, review. Make sure that they're using their inhaler well and also be able to identify if the asthma is controlled or uncontrolled. So there's a good list here from the Lung Foundation guidelines. No, from the asthma handbook. <laughs> and then educate, you know, asthma action plan. Recognize patient risk factors and triggers and make sure they're using their inhaler, inhaler correctly as well. So this here... Uh, that is now hidden, but you can look at it later, is essentially the stepwise management for asthma, just as a revision guide for you guys. And then emergency asthma management, because it does come up, this is off the asthma handbook and basically just says everything as you go through. I'm sure you guys have an acronym for last year's just a refresher. Can anyone tell me if in the community, so not in a hospital, what's the sort of procedure for managing an asthma exacerbation? Really briefly. Yep. Perfect. That's actually perfect. Perfect summary of this slide. <laughs> so if you guys didn't hear that, you can look at this later. It was pretty much spot on. Actually, I think it was spot on. <laughs> so away from respiratory to sort of where the bulk of everything is, and that's under cardiovascular disease. So there is something called the Red Book Guidelines, and the Red Book Guidelines is a prevention RACGP release booklet that basically tells you how to manage chronic diseases and, and involving preventative medicine and cessation of smoking, alcohol and the like. So this is just three bits of it. There are more bits, but I think these are the bits that I primarily want to focus on and they're the most descriptive of chronic disease. So there's some more here as well, less relevant, we're not going to go through them, but from what you can see, the bulk of chronic diseases is your vascular metabolic disease, your lifestyle, your smoking, overweight, nutrition, drinking, physical activity and then your cancer screening. And that's primarily what we're going to do. So absolute cardiovascular risk is very important to know. You don't specifically have to know, you know, everything in the calculator. Um, just a few would be good, maybe three to five. I think some of them are relatively intuitive, so like gender, age, do you have hypertension? Um, but you can see here that essentially if your patient comes in and they're over 45, this is something you should be offering them in a... GP OSCE. And you know, the patient might come in for something completely different. They might not need this at all, but you say, you know, I would like to perform this. We might make a follow-up appointment to go through it. And you've said it and that's enough, but it's important to say it. You don't have to do it, but it's important to say it. And that's the same for the rest of what we're going to go through. So a lot of these preventative strategies, you can say it, you can say maybe we'll discuss this in a follow-up appointment for the interest of time, but you've taken time, you've mentioned it, and that's what's going to give you the points. Um, so you guys can read that. You can see what's considered under high risk. Um, and then, so I don't know if you've seen the old website, but the new website, I think they've redone it. It looks very ugly and it's no longer a nice box. It's like a long list. So I've just summarized it into dot points for you and um, essentially defined it. So it's the combined risk of a heart attack or stroke, sorry, not of stroke, in the next five years. And you can see there's uh, mild, moderate, and severe. So it's less than 10, 10 to 15, and then greater than 15. So low, medium, and high risk, sorry. <laughs> not mild, moderate, or severe. Um, this comes up a lot as well. It's a sort of chart that you can use. Uh, you have to be able to read it. I think reasonably, even without studying it, you can read it if you just take the time. It's relatively well set out. There's also another chart for people with diabetes. So just read the heading, make sure it says without or with diabetes because it does change a little bit, but it does the same sort of cardiovascular risk stratification. Um, and you can see at the bottom, they look at sex, diabetes status, smoking, and age. Um, okay, so let's talk about screening. 
So there's a lot of things that you screen for when someone comes into an appointment, and a lot of the time it's based on their age and their risk factors. And so, like I said again, you know, someone comes in for something, but they're 55, and you don't know if they've had all of this done, you should mention it, you should offer it, you don't have to do it, you can say you'll make up a follow-up appointment for it. But mentioning it to, gives you the points because it shows that you understand age-related screening and risk factor-related screening for various conditions beyond what the patients come in for. So these are the main ones. Blood pressure, you can read that. <laughs> Cholesterol, you can also read that. Kidneys, you can read that. The only thing I wanted to point out is that you've got your sort of high risk for cardiovascular, absolute cardiovascular risk here. But then there's um, high risk specific to the condition, which is slightly different. So diabetes has its own high risk, and then kidneys has its own high risk, which is um, obviously like absolute cardiovascular risk is still important, but just the way they've defined it is based off this like kidney specific list from the, the guideline that I was looking at. So this all comes from base, basically the Red Book guidelines. Um, yeah, and another thing with, with, uh, with diabetes, and actually in general, is that you'll notice that if your patient is of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander origin, screening changes, so you tend to do it a lot younger, you'll do it irrespective of whether they actually have risk factors, which you might not do for someone who isn't Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So I know that you guys get told not to really ask patients anymore, but I think that, you know, if it doesn't state their nationality in the OSCE stem, it might be worthwhile asking just to show that you're thinking of that. Um, Stroke is less important, I think, for our current level because the way you screen for stroke is actually just asking questions, particularly asking questions for, you know, TIAs. There's a specific ABCD2 screening tool you can use. I don't think you particularly might have enough time for it in eight minutes. You can do other things. But these other ones are definitely very important to, to mention to the patient that you would like to do this um, after you've managed the primary condition and, you know, do this in a follow-up appointment maybe even. So... Now I'm going to focus on the specific ones. Uh, so this is essentially the screening to pick up the problem. And now we're going to discuss what happens when you actually eventually pick up the problem. So hypertension is a biggie. Uh, the diagnosis is that it should be elevated on two separate occasions. And you learn this year that there are stratifications for grades and that technically we would like a target blood pressure to be below 140 or 90. There is some argument that if you have other comorbidities, the lower you can get, the better. So around the 130 on, I think, 80 to 90 mark. But the current guidelines do recommend the under 140 or 90. So when you explain to a patient that, you know, this is your blood pressure, and we would like these numbers to be below, it would be 140 or 90. Um, in terms of managing the patient, there's sort of a three-month rule. And there's a three- to six-month rule with most conditions and, you know, giving them drugs. And it's that... You start with a low to moderate dose of the first line drug, and then if it doesn't work, you add a different drug. And then if that doesn't work, you increase the dose of one of the drugs, and then if that doesn't work, the other drug, and then you add the third drug. So you'll see that you don't pump up the dose of the first drug straight away. You can introduce a second agent, and then you start pumping it up. And then towards the end, you know, if that's not working, you probably want specialist referral for, uh, you know, investigation of why, why is this happening. The other thing you should note is if their blood pressure isn't improving, and if their condition isn't improving for anything in GP, are they adherent to their medication? Are they engaging with social services, physio, diabetic educator, etc.? You know, do they have social supports? Do they understand the information that you gave them? So this is all things that you should be considering in an OSCE station. Um, in terms of the, you know, pharmacology, there's your EMQs, your answers, thing everyone wants to hear about. The first line drug is pretty much an ACE or an ARB. I think if you don't know the answer, ACE or an ARB. Sometimes it's not, but generally it's a good guess. <laughs> um, particularly if they've got diabetes, it's an ACE or an ARB. So you can see here I wrote some specific uh, preferred drugs depending on what the patients come in with. Um, so this is just... Okay. So this is a more specific one that will tell you which drugs you need to use depending on the condition. So heart failure, stroke, myocardial infarction, diabetes, etc. And then, you know, the ones you don't use. So you don't use an ACE with an ARB, don't use um, a beta blocker with a ACE, I think. Yeah. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> 
for, for various reasons. And then this is the last thing that I wanted to bring up, which is, I think, just a rehash of everything again. So it's saying, you know, you need antihypertensive drugs. The patient also has this condition. Preferably, this is what you'd use. But you can see, by and large, ACE, ACE, ACE. Ace, ace. So, like, my point is, if you don't know, ace is a good guess, but there are a few that it would be nice to, to be more specific about, particularly if you're in an OSCE station. So, you can flex more in an OSCE station. You can say, like, this drug, but then this drug is also good given that you have these comorbidities. Whereas in an EMQ, generally, you just go ace and move on. So, that's why I said more knowledge for the OSCEs than for an EMQ. And all of these count because the, the assessors, they know these, they had to study these, and they'll be impressed by the fact that you know them. Um, oh, just a few other things. Uh, weight, alcohol, and diet, this is sort of the range that you, you want to have. So when you're counselling someone to not do what they're doing and do something else, this is what you want to bring them down to. So another question that is more of a joke, but does anyone know what pure alcohol is? Because I don't. <laughs> I spent a while looking at it. Yeah, I figured no one would know. That's fine. I don't know what that means, but there you go. Uh, specifically, though, you'll notice that with salt... I know, a very contentious question, right? <laughs> so sorry, bringing you guys back. So salt is particularly important, especially for hypertension and stroke prevention, I think, but hypertension, a biggie. If someone doesn't have hypertension quite yet, you want to bring them to six grams or less, and heart failure as well. But then if they already have it, you're looking more at four grams. I've seen ones that go down to two grams. I think for heart failure is actually more two, although I don't remember from the top of my head. Um, and then five veg and two fruit a day, which I know no one does, but... Still recommend it? All right. Cholesterol and lipids, another thing you should know. These are your normal ranges that you should aim for. And I think one thing to say now that I've gone through a bit is with your management in an OSCE station, most of your peers will know the medication. They will know the names of the medication and they will be able to explain how to use it. So I know it sounds really frou-frou, but the non-pharmacological, the lifestyle, all of that is where you can stand out. So I know everyone focuses on, like, you know, the EMQ answer of, like, it's a statin or it's a zetamibe or something. But ultimately, like, most people will know this to some degree. And the thing that will make you look different is your knowledge of non-pharmacological and your knowledge of lifestyle. And sometimes it's not even the knowledge. It's having the time to put it in because a lot of people will not manage their time as well. So that's something else to keep in, in, in mind. Um, diet. So diet like I said on the previous page, is standard for everyone. But for cholesterol more, cut the fats, increase fiber. There's an argument for sterile enriched foods. So I don't know if you've seen the butters that like claim to get your cholesterol down. They do work. They've got sterols in them. I think there's a lot of sort of contentious questioning about side effects. But they are recommended. They do work. Um, it's like almost butter, but not butter. <laughs> and then pharmacology, you know, statins, First line, azetamibe, then you've got these other ones. And then if someone comes in and they don't have high cholesterol, it's still important to consider prevention of high cholesterol if they have other cardiovascular risk factors. So there's another you know, pit here. If they have a low risk, just do lifestyle modification. Moderate risk, you could consider pharmacotherapy. And if they're high risk and they don't have high cholesterol, you might still want to start them on a low-dose statin just as a prevention. Um, does anyone know what happens if your triglycerides are very, very high? Any takers? That's all right. So these are sort of the different ranges of triglycerides, and you can see the management for them. But with a really high triglyceride, the main thing you can get is pancreatitis. So I don't know if you remember your Get Smash, but one of them is is either cholesterol or triglycerides, but it's a thing. And you'll notice here that there's no statins. It's just says phenofibrate in fish oil. So really, statins are your go-to, but then if you're going really high with triglycerides, you're, you're trying to drop them off. And the reason is, is more that it doesn't really do much to drop the cholesterol, but you actually might consider adding it to the patient if they have other cardiovascular risk factors. So, you know, if they have hypertension or, you know, something else that's lifting that cardiovascular absolute risk up, you might consider adding a statin, despite the fact that it's probably not going to help bring their cholesterol down in that acute setting. Um, all right, diabetes. Oh, I was meant to ask a question for diabetes. <laughs> what HbA1c is normal for a normal person and normal for a person who's diabetic? Hand up, louder. I heard over there. A whisper. Yeah? 
And then for someone who's diabetic? Seven, yeah. So, both of you guys, if you put your hand up, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. So, um, essentially, you guys can read this. Uh, oh, actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. So, OSD risk is an assessment tool for screening for diabetes. So, if I go all the way back to that screening slide, you guys can see here that if someone has an increased risk, they're over 40 or they're Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you do something called an OSD risk. You don't actually do like blood glucose and HbA1c. You do this OSD risk. And the reason for that is that it is very similar to like a tool, like an absolute cardiovascular screening tool, but it doesn't do the same thing. Um, it does the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus in the next five years. So quite similar, you know, in the next five years sort of thing. Looks at these factors and then it sort of stratifies your risk. Um, the other thing to remember also is when you're screening a patient for diabetes, it's not just like the risk on the screening tool, it's also the symptomology. So are they tired? Do they have polyuria, polydipsia, visual neurological symptoms? And then this is your primary diagnostic definition. So I know there's a lot of different ones going around, but essentially this is it. Diabetic, diabetic, diabetic. Changes slightly when you are diabetic. So like you said, HbA1c of less than 7. Preprandial, 8 to 6, fasting, 8 to 6, 6 to 10. So the values are slightly different. So if you're out counselling someone, on, for example, their insulin intake as a diabetic, these are the values that you want to quote, not these. Um, this is a really good picture that I'm very happy I found last year because it tells you how to screen for diabetes in a more complex way. So you will notice that, you know, the complexity of the topics from third year do develop more in fourth year. So when someone has a fasting blood glucose that's sort of in this like 5.5 to 7 range, you want to do more things and you want to do an OGTT. And then from the OGTT, you can see whether it's normal glucose tolerance, impaired fasting glucose, and impaired glucose tolerance. And unfortunately, guys, you have to memorize these values. Um, I actually don't remember if I got tested on them, but everyone around me knew it, so I felt pressured to know it. So you should probably know it. <laughs> um, diabetes manager, I really like this. And I actually like this... Maybe not these specific things, but I like this for any condition. So when you address a patient in a GP clinic, you should be considering all of these allied health. Also, don't just rattle off allied health. Try and link it in with what you're actually going to provide to the patient. So, you know, if you have diabetes, it's really important that, you know, we look at your nutrition. Um, do you know anything about, you know, healthy eating? What do you currently eat? I don't really have time in this consultation, but I'm happy to do a follow-up appointment to discuss that, or we can link you in with a diabetic dietitian. That's the sort of thing you want to say. You don't want to say, I'll link you in with a diabetic dietitian, a podiatrist, this. You don't want to list it. You want to link it in with what you're saying. Um, this is just extra things that you can probably say they'll make you look good when you diagnose someone with diabetes, just a few new things. Um, these are mostly sourced from various sources, so it's not like one guideline. Some of these is from the one diabetic guideline, and then others I think I just got from other places. It's a rough guide to sort of... Uh, you know, if someone comes in with diabetes, when's the last time they got their eyes checked? When's the last time they saw their podiatrist? They should be seeing them every one year, every two years. Of course, if they've got problems going on, they probably need to see them more often. But, you know, it's a bit of a screening tool that is different from the previous screening tools we saw because the previous screening tools assume that the patient is fine. And then this screening tool assumes that the patient has diabetes. So it's slightly different. Um, pharmacological manager, people can get a little hung up on this, so I thought I'd just clarify it. There's an official diabetic handbook guideline, and this is from it. First line is metformin. Second line is sulfonurias, or you can use these, mainly this. Third line, you can do triple oral therapy with GLP-1, or you can go to insulin. This is pretty much what I learned last year. Worked for me. Start with metformin. You can go to this. If for some reason they don't tolerate it, you just move to the next one. So if they can't metformin, you do this. And then if they have metformin but they can't have that, you just pick one of these, you know, adjust it around. But generally, that's the way. One, two, three. These are interchangeable. And then these no one really uses, but you should know them because of their side effect profile. So coming to that, apart from knowing the medication, you need to know a little bit more about it, especially for diabetes. Um, so can anyone tell me a diabetic medication from this list that's not metformin and give me a side effect? Any from that, for any from here? Yep. Good. Yep. Yep. I think, yep. <laughs> All right. So I know it was really quiet, but we'll restate it on the next slide. So I have made a list for you guys. 
that you can learn and then hopefully not have to learn more, but maybe you might want to read around it. So metformin, this is what it is, this is what it does, this is what it causes. So as you guys said, I don't know if you heard from the back, but hypoglycemia is one for sulfonurias, and then sodium glucose transporters cause urinary tract infections. And most of these are, are quite intuitive, so you know, um, inhibits reabsorption of glucose in the kidney, which means you basically pee out your sugar. So you're going to have sugary bladder, and that's more likely for bacteria to grow because bacteria like sugar. Um, and then a few other things that you should know. You don't hear them a lot, but they have a really interesting side effect profile. Atypical fractures, and with this specific one, you can get bladder cancer. It's like an increased risk. Um, yeah, nothing else. The, oh, the other thing I wanted to stress is that one of these from memory, yeah. So GLP-1s cause weight loss, and similarly with one other one. So this is not in an order of... So by the way, guys, this is not in the order of importance. This is just in the order of what fit in the columns. So don't, like, learn them in, like, a list. Yeah. Um, so this one mildly lowers your weight. This one also mildly lowers your weight. So it's just, you know, if you have someone coming in and their BMI is like 35, maybe you'd prefer one drug over the other, and that's a pretty good indicator of why. Sulfonuria is causing DNA, I think. Um, okay. So I know that might have been a lot of content, but are you guys understanding the general framework of what I'm trying to teach you guys? Does everything sort of make sense? Any specific questions? Okay. So prevention of chronic diseases is the other sort of, remember when I brought up number seven, number eight, number nine on the Red Book guidelines, moving to the next one. So this is a new tool that I quite like. It's very ROCGP. It's called the five A's. Um, ask, assess, advise, assist, degree, and arrange. When you want to introduce, you know, exercise more, stop drinking as much, stop smoking, this is the best tool to use. So SNAP, which you guys learned previously, falls under the ask. So you want to identify what the problem is. Then you want to assess it, you know, like, how many drinks do you have a day? How many cigarettes do you have a day? And look at the patient thing. Are they actually ready to change their lifestyle? So I've had a lot of OSCE stations where I've said, you know, I've noticed you're smoking. Would you like to maybe discuss cutting it down? And they're like, I don't know. And then I'll say, you know, maybe in the interest of time, I'll book you a follow-up appointment in a week and we could discuss it more and you'll have some time to think about it. Fitting into my eight minutes, got the point across. Everything worked out great. <laughs> But then, obviously, if they want to hear more, so if this is a station about maybe alcohol, for example, you would like to go on and give them some information. So this is your Murtaugh's 10-step, you know, education, management. You'll go through it later on. And then, you know, assist degree, that's your management. Start a medication if you need to, do some lifestyle changes. And then always arrange a referral for all up and do prevention. This is a nice tool. I think it does translate into the 10-step Murtag sort of thing. It's very overlappy, but I think it's very important. And then also, if you're teaching a patient, you can always whip out the prochaska de Clementi cycle. Nice to know that you still remember your preclin. <laughs> um, all right, so specific for smoking and alcohol, I think those are the two most important ones. So there are four medications you can use for smoking. So smoking and alcohol, I think the best guideline for them is ETG, actually. ETG has a very good two articles on them. Mainly, this is where this is from, and it goes through it really nicely. So in short... You have to know how they work because you can't just tell a patient to take a medication when it's a little bit more involved than just taking it every day. So these courses generally last 12 weeks, with the exception of this one, which lasts nine weeks. Nicotine is kind of the only one where you don't want the person to be smoking while they're on it. The rest you can actually start concurrently with someone smoking, and then they smoke half, uh, and then they quit smoking as they're taking the medication. So nicotine comes in different ways, some risk factors. Some people do start two weeks before they quit can happen, but generally not advice to smoke. It increases the side effects and I think also may affect cardiovascular risk, although I don't remember. Don't quote me on that. Varincyclin. <laughs> um, same with this one and same with this one. You start two weeks before you're ready to quit smoking. Take it for two weeks, then stop smoking. And then you continue it for 12 weeks, uh, apart from this one, which is nine weeks. Um, you need to know a few side effects. So if someone comes in with seizures or eating disorders of this, you don't want to start them on this medication. Similarly with this, per this drug, you know, if someone comes in with kidney disease or they're pregnant, you don't want to start that either. Um, nortriptyline, which is hidden here that you can't see, has its own set of side effects, and you might want to consider those as well. So I think, 
you know, this can very well come up, and I think what really decides which one you're going to take is the side effect profile. But then also consider if they have no side effect profile, you'll probably go, go to as nicotine. Something else I find useful to tell patients, especially when it comes to quitting, because it's quite hard, is that for smoking, I think evidence has shown that sometimes it takes people up to seven times to actually fully quit smoking. So they'll try seven times, they'll keep failing, and then they'll be able to quit. So just, you know, remember that you have to reassure the patient and you have to create some sort of rapport with them. So don't just rattle off what I've listed here. Try and contextualise it to the patient and make it appropriate. Alcohol. This is not your acute sort of withdrawal stuff. You'll hear more about that in psych. But in terms of getting someone actually off alcohol, there's disulfiram, a camprosate, and naltrexone. This is the one, this one and this one, where you can't drink while you're on it. So this one is the one that basically gives you alcohol poisoning. It gives you that extra alcohol effect of you know, nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, palpitations, and it can cause really big problems. So they recommend that you get it daily dispensed, either from someone that you trust or from like a pharmacist. So you have to get the one tablet a day, you can't take more. And you also can't, this should say 24, sorry, not 34. Um, start it until you're 24 hours alcohol free. With this one, they usually recommend you start it one week after drinking cessation. So they say like when you go to hospital for acute withdrawal, usually there for 10 days, you don't have your alcohol for 10 days and then you start this. So that's generally how they recommend it. Um, a few other things you need to know. And then naltrexone is the one that you can combine with alcohol use, and they recommend it for binge drinkers. You just have to monitor LFTs. And then also note, because this blocks opioids, if your patient has chronic pain or some sort of thing where they take a lot of opioids, you can't give them this because it's not going to, it's just going to make one thing worse. And the other thing probably not even that better. So <laughs> consider that as well. Like I said, don't rattle these off. Try and contextualize to the patient. Cancers. Coming to the end here, almost. So... There's a few cancers here that you need no screening about. Most importantly, these, no screening for them. Don't mention them. They're important to consider. Maybe testicular, you know, if someone comes in and they're worried, have a feel, but otherwise, like prostate and ovarian, you don't screen for it. Remember all this, this is screening. So if someone has a family history of prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, or testicular cancer, you refer them to a specialist and you don't do screening. You do proper, you know, preventative medicine for them. This is kind of more for the, for the general population sort of thing. You know, if someone has like five people in their family who've died of prostate cancer, you're probably not going to be using these clinical guidelines. You'll probably be referring them to a genetic specialist and dealing with it like that. So breast cancer, this is sort of the generic thing you say, 50 to 74 years every two years. Um, changes a little bit depending on your high risk. But again, you know, if you're really high risk, got multiple people in the family, surveillance program with specialist. Skin cancers, um, usually it's opportunistic. The full body skin check thing isn't really unless you're at a high risk, so you've had skin cancer or, you know, you're immunosuppressed, arsenic exposure for some reason. Um, and the thing is, you know, just skin check them every six or 12 months. You also teach them, you know, prevention. So bucket hats, oh, not specifically bucket hats, anything with a broad rim, but I thought bucket hats were quite cute. <laughs> and um, 30 plus SPF sunscreen. Self-examination as well, you know, if they've got a spot, does it change in shape, is it growing, is the colour different, is it oozing, is it inflamed, is there any... Um, I don't know what that says. <laughs> Something changes. Cervical cancer as well. More in pediatrics for some reason, but it's changed now. It's every five years from 25 to 74 years. Or if the person's not sexually active, it's two years after the first sexual encounter. But not if they're under 25, if they're over 25. So if someone had their first sexual encounter at 18, you'd still test them at 25. The reason for that change, um, although you will hear it more during the PEDS lecture, is that uh, the way HPV works, now that they test for the virus, um, it takes about five to 10 years for a cancer to actually develop, so there's no point in doing it every two years, particularly now, because we're testing for the viral pathogen rather than doing purely like cell cytometry sort of stuff. Anyway, you hear about more. But with this list, I have missed something. I've missed a very important cancer. Last question, can anyone tell me what it is? Well, you all said it. That's fine. <laughs> Just whoever you heard then. Yeah, bowel cancer, perfect. Colorectal cancer is a biggie, and it has its own sort of thing that you need to go through. So depending on the risk you're at, you have different things that you need to do. And you can read this in your own time. And another thing, apart from all of these sort of specific ones, is that generally if someone had cancer at a certain age and it was younger than this sort of 50 to 74-year-old mark, you start 10 years prior. So if someone developed colorectal cancer at 48, like their father, you start screening this person from 38. Um, a few other things, referral to specialist. High risk is... 
is really high risk. I think more you need to know moderate and low risk. High risk is, you know, multiple people had it or, you know, they had this familial lynch, familial polyposis, multiple relatives. It was high risk cancer, so they had several cancers or grossly when they did histopath on the cancer, it was a very bad cancer, that sort of thing. All right. So like I said, I promised I'd give you guys the guidelines. These are, I think, the big, big guidelines. You need this is not guideline, but the rest are really good guidelines. Um, so COPD get X guidelines, Lung Foundation, Australian Asthma Handbook for Asthma, RCGP Red Book guidelines for the bulk of it. For hypertension specifically, there's a Heart Foundation guideline. There's an RCGP guideline for type 2 diabetes, separate to this. And then ETG for alcohol and smoking cessation is quite good. So unfortunately with chronic diseases, it is guidelines, guidelines, guidelines. I think I've tried my best to summarize pretty much everything you'd know, and I think if you knew everything on these slides, you'd be very, very well off. I've even tried to put in as many screenshots as I could to avoid you having to go through these guidelines. But I think in general, if you guys are happy to just read through it once or twice, not everything obviously, but what you think is important, I think it would definitely benefit you. And the last thing I wanted to do to finish up, I don't know how I'm going for time. Okay. Um, I'm just hitting my 45 minute mark, is to show you sort of what I meant by going through an OSCE case. So this is a picture from a GP book that my mum had that I borrowed from her or stole. <laughs> but um, you guys can read this. Essentially, this person's come in with hypertension for the first time. There was some stuff wrong with them, blah, 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 blah. How are you going to address this person? So your normal third year thing would be like, you have hypertension. Here is, oh, you're already on this ace. What do I do now? <laughs> so you need to do a bit more. And I think this is sort of how I would plan my approach before I went in to see the patient. So yes, they have hypertension. Yes, it's poorly managed. From what we've said today, most likely I would add a second antihypertensive medication because they're already on an ACE. I can do that. I know that. I studied for it. But what will set me apart? And this is the rest of this. So this person is 67. They're female. They're overweight. They also have asthma. So apart from all of this, asthma, you know, is it well controlled? How has it been going? How is your inhaler technique? Have you been to the hospital recently? Asking these questions offhandedly at the side will show you that you read the stem and that you are more holistic. But then cardiovascular risk, we're talking about she's got obesity and hypertension. When's the last time we did an absolute cardiovascular risk? When's the last time we did a cholesterol and lipid? She needs it done based on her age. Given that she's high risk, she's over 40 and obese, we should be screening for HbA1c and, F and um, fasting blood glucose. Kidney function, risks for that. She was hypertensive and obesity. We should be doing this. Weight also, you know, she's in an obese category, so we need to weigh her. So you can see all of these things you can say in your OSCE station. And it will set you apart because you're not just focusing on the hypertension. You're dealing with all these other problems that you've seen here. It doesn't say anywhere her investigation results for all these bloods. She probably hasn't had it done. So you as a GP, you're the primary port of care and you can bring all of this in and fully manage the patient and give them you know, this really solid management plan that doesn't just include hypertension. It also deals with their comorbid factors and comorbid problems. And importantly here, did anyone notice she drinks four to six standard drinks a day? We said, for a female, max, it's one standard drink a day. So we have to deal with our alcohol. But then snap, right? What happened to S, N, and P, right? We don't know that. It doesn't say that anywhere. So we should ask her this and maybe make a follow-up appointment to discuss quitting smoking if she, uh, well, she's not smoking, um, to discuss, you know, eating better, especially because she's overweight. She probably doesn't eat well. Maybe we need to link her in with a dietitian. Physical activity. She's 67. She's retired. Maybe she doesn't get out of her house as much as she used to. And then finally, vaccinations. So at her age, influenza yearly and pneumococcal. So you can see on those vaccination that was in the previous slides that you would say these two. And lastly, cancer. So based on her age, based on her gender, colorectal, breast and cervical cancer screening. When's the last time she has it done? Does she need it done? She probably does because it doesn't say it here. So in this consultation that comes in looking like it's about hypertension, you really need to hone in on everything else as well. I'm not asking you to dedicate your full eight minutes to that, but even a minute of just listing these things and saying that, you know, this is a lot to cover in eight minutes. I'd like you to come back in a week to discuss this and maybe have a think about these things before we discuss them. Shows that you've actually thought about the patient as a whole and not just the presenting complaint. They're not just a stem on the door. And that's what I think will really set you apart in these chronic disease stations. Because like I said, at the end of the year, most people will know how to manage hypertension. Most people will know how to manage hyperlipidemia. But these things 
if you can get them, is what will set you apart. Even from just the global markets, the fact that you considered the patient and you thought about this, or even if you forget your management, the fact that you know you can always look up what the management for hypertension is on a computer, and, and the assessors know that. But you can't look this up. You have to know that specifically for the patient, you need to do these things. Does that make sense? That's actually it. Um, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I hope there wasn't particularly too much and it wasn't too overwhelming. But yeah, all good. Um, like I said, this is my email and this is my name. You can either shoot me a Facebook message or email me. I prefer Facebook messages, but email is also fine. <laughs> Thanks, guys.